So in the 1800s, the U.S. is really coming into its own. It's kind of an adolescent as a nation. And a lot of times in adolescence, people start pushing the boundaries. They start questioning authority. And so a lot of reform movements and demands for change are born in the 19th century for this very reason, a very natural stage of development for an individual leads to them questioning authority like their parents as adolescents. Well, in the 1800s, the U.S. is an adolescent nation, and therefore you see a lot of reform movements. These can be summarized by the Big Five, and these movements are abolition, probably one you're most familiar with, another you're very familiar with, women's rights, temperance, sometimes referred to as prohibition, is dealing with the evils people viewed alcohol having on society. I'm sure you've heard of that before, although not in as near as much detail as uh, abolition or women's rights. The child labor movement or anti-child labor movement. And lastly, the push for public education for people. So these are the big five, the five main movements. The abolition movement. Here you see an artistic depiction of Am I Not a Man and a Brother? And showing that how can a human being be treated this way? And the abolition movement attracted more and more and more followers over time using this exact moral question, Am I Not a Man and a Brother? It's much more predominant in the North than the South for obvious reasons. The South was very dependent on slave labor. And it didn't really gain real traction until after the Mexican-American War because things like the Missouri Compromise was thought to have solved the issue for all time. Also, the widespread use of Eli Whitney's cotton gin really hadn't taken hold just yet in the earlier 1800s. And so the expansion of slavery wasn't near as big or as controversial an issue until after the Mexican-American War and the debates had with the Compromise of 1850. And we'll talk much more about that in class down the line. Northerners knew that they benefited from the slave system as well. So sometimes you had Northerners who they didn't like the idea of the abolition movement, but nonetheless they were quiet about it because they were economically benefiting. So an example would be textile mills in the North processing Southern cotton. They know that the slave labor in the South has produced that cotton. They are economically benefiting from it, so they simply don't have as loud of a voice against abolition as they do later on and closer to the Civil War. The women's rights movement. Initially this is not about voting rights. This is about women having the ability to own their own property, to not have that property transferred from one male in their life to another, such as from father to husband or from brother to husband if their father had passed away. Men really held so much power over women in society that women simply wanted equal legal treatment. And once they achieved some of those things, then they focused much more on voting rights. But initially, it really isn't about voting rights. It becomes that after they achieve some of their initial goals, like not needing to have a male chaperone in order to be out in public. Women could literally not just go for a walk because it was viewed as suspicious. You needed to have a man escorting you. No need for marriage. What if we wanted to live independently for our whole lives and have our own property, which leads into the next bullet point, or control our own finances and work our own jobs? That's the last bullet. So women did not want to be as dependent on men, and eventually that leads to wanting voting rights. The temperance movement was supported by people that thought that problems in society could be explained by someone's alcohol consumption. Things like spousal abuse, the deadbeat dad who's never around helping with the kids, the financial squalor of families because 
the father has gone out and spent all the money at a saloon. The poor health of communities that are not seeing a doctor as frequently as they should because the money is all being spent at the local saloon. And so this is really where it starts. It grows during the progressive movement later in history. You do have an amendment to the Constitution outlawing alcohol, but it was so unenforceable that it was actually later repealed. But the temperance movement, it is these problems in society that lead people to support this temperance movement. And then the child labor movement, I have no specific notes for you to take other than people were just fighting for the idea that children were having their childhood taken away from them, being forced to work in factories or on the right you see photos of children who were working in coal mines. You see some textile mill photographs here, some newspaper delivery boy photographs. The, these are all th just examples of children who are having their childhood taken away by having to go to work and help support their family. And so the anti-child labor movement was born out of many of these images. And the last of the big five, what should children be doing with their time rather than helping support the family with a menial job in a factory? or delivering papers, or in a coal mine, or a textile mill, they should be in school. And a man by the name of Horace Mann came up with the concept of a common school, where children would go and they would all be there together, regardless of their age. And this is very well depicted in a television show like Little House on the Prairie, where kids met in the local church and were taught by one individual teacher, and you can imagine how difficult that was for the teacher to deal with so many different age levels all simultaneously. But the whole point of Horace Mann's movement was that society will be bettered by this more educated public that will be coming in future generations if we move forward with this concept of common schools funded by local and state governments. That is the end of the 19th century reform movement presentation. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out. Otherwise, I'll see you in class.